Hello everyone, I am Parul Singh and I work as a senior software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, today, we talk about how you can power the efficiency of your cluster and make sure that you're consuming less energy and if possible, control your carbon footprints when you're running your workloads on the cloud. So who we are, uh, we are a group of people who are taking a community-based approach on environment sustainability. We are also part of the CNCF tag, environment sustainability. And if you want to check out a proposal, the QR code will take you over there. But uh, in general, our mission is to advocate for, develop, support, and help evaluate environment sustainability initiatives in cloud native technologies. And we also aim to identify values and possibly provide incentives to service providers so that they could reduce the energy consumption and control their carbon footprint through cloud native tooling. The great thing is, as of June, Kepler is part of the CNC of Sandbox project. So that's a great step for us. And what brought us or what was the thing that initiated to bring the sustainability in computing? Uh, in 2021, an ACM technology brief uh, estimated that the ICT sector or the information or technology, uh, communication technology sector attributed to 1.8% to 3.9% of total global carbon emission. And to give you a context, that is more than the carbon emission of Italy and Germany as a country combined. So we do emit a lot of carbon. And so this brought us to ask questions, how you can measure energy consumption indirectly when you don't have access to the racks in the data center, you cannot uh, install specialized hardware, and how do you measure energy consumption of workloads? You, if you're using any cloud, you, it is possible that you do get the total energy consumption as a tenant, so does the other tenant, but how can you pinpoint what was the energy consumption of particular workloads? And again, when you're running in a private cloud or when you're running in a hybrid cloud or in a public cloud where you are not the only one, but there are many other people who are resources, how do you attribute power to specific process containers and pods? So uh, with all these thoughts in mind, we designed our cloud native sustainability stack and it has many projects, but today I'm just going to talk about Kepler and the Kepler model server. Uh, but before that, I want to uh, give you an idea of what are the principles that we follow to attribute energy consumption. So we, uh, we did a bunch of experiments, read a lot of paper, and come to the conclusion that power consumption is attributed to resource usage by process containers, pods, etc. that's running. And this is one example. Let's say that you are only uh, in this picture we only sh talk about the CPU usage or the CPU power consumption. So let's say that you have a pod that has a one container and it is consuming 10% of the CPU, then you can say that it contributed to 10% of total CPU consumption. So if it is consuming 50%, you can say it attributed to 50% of CPU power consumption. So the first uh, project, obviously, Kepler, which is based, called uh, Kubernetes-based efficient power level exporter. And it uses software counters to measure power consumption by hardware resources and exports them as Prometheus metrics. Down the line, we are thinking of moving from Prometheus and uh, adopting OLTP so that anyone, uh, any monitoring stack that is compatible with OTLP protocol, they can, uh, they can consume our metrics. So Kepler employs three-pronged approach, which is uh, per pod level. Uh, it first reports per pod level energy consumption, including the CPU, GPU, or RAM. And it works both for bare metal as well as uh, virtual machines. And it exports the energy metrics as Prometheus metrics. Obviously, the goal of Kepler is to measure power consumption. You don't want Kepler to measure these power consumption and itself contributing to 20% of the power usage. So to minimize that, uh, we made Kepler very lightweight so that we, so that's why we're using eBPF to attribute power consumption to a particular process. And uh, this I will talk later, but not all the time you have access to hardware uh, power consumption using RAPL or ACPI, for example, in case of VM, you cannot have access to uh, the power meter. So in that, that case, we use uh, uh, machine learning models to estimate energy. 
So this is the bottom-up approach. And for data collection and data aggregation, Kepler uses, as I said, software counters and power meters uh, to, uh, to calculate the power consumption by the hardware. And then for data modeling and presentation, what Kepler does is uh, converts these power consumption into energy estimation using machine learning. So uh, how does this machine learning model get formed? They are formed by Kepler model server. When the, uh, when the node energy is not provided to you by, uh, when, or in the absence of power meter, what Kepler relies on is pre-trained models that can estimate energy consumption. And right now, the, the stack that we're using is TensorFlow, Keras, Flask, and Prometheus. So we use two kind of models, the CPU core energy consumption model, which uh, is trained on features like CPU architecture, current CPU cycle, current CPU instruction and CPU time. And you have the DRAM energy consumption model that uses CPU architecture, current cache misses, and memory working set. Sorry. So there are two phases, the training phase and the uh, exporting phase. So for training, the Kepler model server have no, has agents sitting on each of the nodes. And these agents scrapes the node metrics and exports them to Prometheus. And then the Kepler model server scrapes the Prometheus and forms the data set both for training as well as testing, and it trains the model, evaluates the model, and if it's of acceptable accuracy, you can use the model. For using the model or exporting the model, Kepler uh, uh, used Flask endpoints. Down the line, again, as I said, we are going to go with open telemetry, but you can also load the model in memory to do the estimates. So how do you decide what models you're going to use and uh, uh, and when you have to use. So it depends on generally the available measurements. If you have access to the total power, then you use a power ratio modeling where the usage is a ratio of the power consumed by the processes by the total summation of power. But as I mentioned, when power metrics cannot be measured, for example, in case of a virtual machine, you can estimate power by usage metrics as input features of the train model. And you can do three level of estimation. You can measure node total power, which includes fan power supply, and the internal components such as CPU and memory, and then you can do the pod power. So this is uh, the various scenarios on when you use what model. Supposedly, the first row, when you have a bare metal with x86 with power meter, you measure total power using ACPI. You measure node component power using REPL, and pod power is just a ratio. And the last row, if you see, which is a pure VM scenario, when you don't have access to node power or node component power, then the pod power is just power estimation. Uh, the link will, you will have these slides, and the link will give you more information on the various metrics that we use. And as I said, Kepler works not only on bare metal as well as VM, but now Kepler goes beyond Kubernetes because we have created an RPM that you can run on the Linux server that can estimate power consumption of individual process outside the Kubernetes ecosystem. So um, I have a few screenshots that I want to share that shows you very interesting Grafana dashboard. At least it's interesting to me. So for this cluster, we have uh, six nodes, and Kepler runs as a daemon set. So it is six instances of it on each of the nodes. And we have a Grafana route. And this is the first dashboard. So we use a third party API to compute the carbon intensity by region. And this is for United States. And uh, uh, you can see over here the various colored graph is the carbon intensity by the region. And you can see that uh, the first is uh, highest and the down is the lowest. So BPA, which is like a step graph, it's the lowest, while the highest is uh, the, also the so-called purple MISO. MISO is the highest. The second dashboard, now that you have the carbon intensity by region, you can use Kepler to translate that carbon intensity to particular process. You know what is the energy consumption uh, or energy estimates, and you know what was the kiloton per hour carbon emission. And using these two values, you can correlate what was the carbon footprint of each of the namespace or each of the pods. So for example, over here, we are using the BPA region. And the carbon intensity on the left-hand side, you can see, is ranging between point, uh, anything between point 0.6 to 1. But power consumption of all namespace is a straight line. Now we have the MISO region. So the carbon footprint is ranging between 4 to 5, but the power consumption is constant. 
So you can see that you can control your carbon emission if you can schedule your workloads in region that have less carbon intensity. So we have applied Kepler in the open source. We have worked with IBM to design something which is called Clever, which is a container level energy efficient VPA recommender. We also worked with Microsoft and the Keda team and we have made carbon array scaling with Keda. And something that I worked on is carbon array scheduling. So if you can uh, have the access of the details of what is the source of your power, can you control the carbon intensity of your workload relying more on renewable energy and less on fossil fuel? So that is all. Uh, this QR code will take you to a sustainability stack. This is the link to Kepler and the model server, but uh, you can check out other projects as well. And now, I guess we have time for a few questions. If you don't have a question, you can also have suggestions. Uh, uh, your model looks very interesting. It basically would capture also a use case when, for example, one workload uh, configures a machine to be uh, scheduled or in, in the region. So that basically that changes your total consumption. So if you have one more machine, because one, one workload particularly needs to scale up so that, so that one more machine is, is, is scheduled. Mm -hmm. And if I understand it right, you would capture that because you are looking at the consumption on the whole cluster. Level, and then you, you basically correlate it to. So, to the uh, region, how do we. So, we get the and first could thing. You the question? Oh, sorry. Could you repeat the question for us? So, so that so we that we get the okay. Uh, so, you were saying that uh, if I got it right, what you were asking is if I control the machines that are in a region, I can somehow control the carbon intensity of the workloads. Is that your question? Yeah, especially about the use case when one more machine is scheduled or is created okay. for, for the... You mean to say machine or you mean to say workloads? Um, virtual machines. Virtual machines, so like okay. Like open chip, yeah, we have a Got it, yeah. Machine yeah. set, right, and it could create a new machine under certain circumstances. Got it. So, um, said Kepler will not do that you have to get a third party polarity. and if you have access to that then definitely you can if you're adding a machine you would have the uh, you can do the estimate of the total power, like all the nodes that are present in the cluster and definitely you get the workload estimate uh, from Kepler now tying these together definitely you can do it but uh, the that we are finding is getting a carbon intensity data because everybody have carbon intensity but they don't talk about how they are exporting it there's no transparency and we just have to accept what they are giving us so we are working to get a more standardized open source and transparent way to get this carbon intensity data but if we have access to reliable carbon intensity data definitely that can be done Anybody has used Kepler or heard about it before? Like I know we have one person who use a project, but anybody else heard about Kepler before? Okay, I'm sure you will now. <laughs> okay, nice. Okay, um, how much time we have? Right. So <clears throat> uh, you asked how, how do we get the carbon, in, how do we use carbon intensity uh, information to do the scheduling? Um, I have some slides in case somebody was interested. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, as I said, we used rely on third-party API to get the carbon intensity. So what we did was we developed a carbon intensity forecaster that scrapes these third-party API to give you what is going to be the carbon intensity in some step in the future. And for this experiment, we were calculating carbon intensity for a day ahead. So the first thing was you get these carbon intensity data from the forecaster, and the forecaster is kind of... Uh, 
There's a cron job that would be querying the forecaster to get the carbon intensity data for each of the node. And depending if the carbon intensity is super high, we label them as red. If the carbon intensity is somewhere in the middle, we label them as yellow. And if it's like the lowest, we label them as uh, green. Now there's something which is called uh, uh, labels and taint in Kubernetes ecosystem. And using those features, we uh, control that. So when the node has a really high carbon intensity, we label it as red, and we also apply a taint to it. If the node is some, has a lowest, it gets as you can see, is yellow and no taint. So tainting a node means uh, if a pod, and this is the pod spec. So over here in the pod spec, you can see this pod is explicitly declaring it prefers a node that has a label density as green, but it has tolerations for any node that has been tainted as red. And uh, the toleration second, for the sake of this experiment, we made it as five. That means if a pod is scheduled on a node that is tainted red, it would just stay there for five seconds and then will be evicted, just to be clear that the workloads are moving. So as the node is turning from red to green, uh, the scheduler, which is the Kubernetes inherent scheduler, will see the pod spec, will see what is the taint and labels on the node. And it would evict the pod from node one that is going from green to red and schedule it to node two, which is going from red to green. So uh, tainting nodes will ensure that pods are evicted by the nodes if pods do not have tolerations for that. Somebody asked me this question yesterday uh, in the workshop. What if my, I care about carbon intensity and I don't care that my pod should be evicted? So in that case, you don't need to provide these additional information in your pod spec. Just don't provide a node selector and don't provide a tolerations, and then it would be considered general. Yeah, thank you so much.